Welcome back to the Genesis Designs and Modelcraft bench and this is part 6 of the Gulf War Tornado Geo 1 build and we are finally going to start putting some of this desert pink paint on this thing. Um, so before we start I have masked off the nose cone, the black areas. Uh, I also, this isn't just masking, this is also protection. I pinged this uh, turned brass peto a couple of times whilst I've been working on it and just kept bending it ever so slightly and figured sooner or later I'd bend it too much or snap it entirely and then I would have been terrifically annoyed so I've just created this is just a little bit of random card that was kicking about just made a little sleeve and it's all taped on and that as well as masking off the black is also protecting that pito probe it's, it's one of those calculated uh, risks that you take with model building um, it's nice to not have that seam where the pito joins but then you obviously have the added danger of knocking it off and wrecking it. Um, so as we already said in the last video, this I have been doing some testing on these tail planes and I used the Ammo of MIG Scratches Effect chip, Chipping Fluid. I decided to continue testing uh, before committing to the main model and I, I had a look at using hairspray on the other surfaces and I have to say I do prefer the way the paint chips when using hairspray. The differences are subtle, but essentially the the hairspray, it's more difficult to chip the paint when you use hairspray than it is when you use the ammo stuff. Uh, and I think for the effects that I'm trying to achieve on this, that is preferable. To This, this, is, this was very easy, so much so that it, it wanted to come off in, in big chunks. Um, and it was difficult to make it look sort of random and actually worn through rather than just peeled off. So I think for this model, or for this, the effect that I'm actually trying to achieve, I think the hairspray is a better option. Now, the hairspray that I'm using is just some dirt cheap basic supermarket hairspray. I've had this can for several years now, um, but it's nearly gone actually. <laughs> I've nearly used it all. Uh, you can spray this stuff straight onto your model out of the can if you wish however word of warning um, although this is essentially a water-based product because you can wash it off with water there are some pretty heavy duty solvents in the in the makeup of this so if you spray it directly onto the model you can find that you get a bit of discoloring uh, to the paint surface it's slightly unpermanent you can sort of get rid of it with a clear coat but depending on the sort of chipping effects that you're looking to achieve you do need to bear that in mind so if you're going to reveal a lot of the base colour it's probably better to not spray it directly out the can. So what I've done quite simply is decanted some into an airbrush so in here I have a bit of hairspray ready to go and in the other airbrush obviously have the desert sand mixed up and ready to go that's thinned with Mr. Colour Thinner as usual, so it will grip pretty hard, which also helps to make it more difficult to chip it off. Uh, and then, aside from that, a, a quick word on the way I'm going about this. I am replicating a specific aircraft, Foxy Killer, so obviously enough I am using aircrafts of that aircraft uh, to help me with this. And just as an example of what I'm talking about, this is my phone and I'm probably not supposed to do this for copyright and what have you but you see I've got a photograph there and if I zoom up on it see I've got some chipping around this panel and I can see I, to, to be honest you need to be a bit careful with this because the majority of the photos of this aircraft are post conflict and you can see there's been a lot of touch up work done so they're not actually most of them showing it as it was at the time of the conflict so there's going to be a bit of guesswork uh, obviously I don't have photographs of every single area on the aircraft so some guesswork will be involved and some uh, some use of photos of other aircrafts so that it won't be can't be should I say absolutely accurate so what I'm not going to do is spray hairspray on the whole thing I don't want to chip the whole thing I want to chip these specific areas so that's where I'm going to put the hairspray and the reason for that is that the use of the hairspray creates this uh, 
sort of non-stick effect in between these paint layers. So what you can find later on if you're masking uh, and even deckling actually, you can find that the moisture that you use with that, you can cause yourself issues if you've got chipping fluid sat underneath your paint layers. So if you don't need it there, don't have it there basically. So anyway, that said, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start on this area of the left nose. I'm not going to document the entire process because this is going to take several hours and it's going to be done across a few days. Um, but I'll, sh I'll show you how we'll go about it uh, and I'll talk as I go on. So first things first, I've got my laptop at the side with the image up. Unfortunately, I can't, I'm not technically minded enough to figure out a way of having that on screen so you can see that as well. So you'll just have to, you'll just have to play along. So I'm going to put some hairspray on with this airbrush in the places that I want it. Obviously it's a clear fluid so you just have to watch the wet area where you're spraying. do it. As long as you've got a, a coat that you know it's covered and it's not just speckly you should be okay. So the next step is just start putting some of this desert pink on. Now the reason I'll be doing the whole thing in several stages over a long period of time is that when you put the paint on there's kind of a window of opportunity for doing the chipping. Um, I find and bear in mind I'm talking about the system I'm using, the paints I'm using. It's different for all the different paints and, and the different methods. But I find that if you leave the paint for too long, it, it basically gets progressively more and more difficult to chip. You can still do it, but it, just, it takes longer and longer and it's harder and harder. And the same goes for the depth of your paint layer. The, the thicker it is or the heavier you apply it, the more difficult it is to get it to chip nicely. Okay, so... Anyway, I digress. Let's get some paint on this thing and on my finger. Let's start up here, I think. see when you've got coverage because of the fact that we've got camo underneath this um, you, you can still see the camo and, and when you can't see the camo anymore you know that you've got enough paint on there and you have um, the colour density that's required. My chipping brush, now the chipping brush is just a paintbrush obviously but I've cut it way down so it's quite obviously it's blunt but also relatively stiff and that's important. Um, some chipping fluids will work just fine with a very soft brush. Um, I find that hairspray in this paint not so much. You do need a bit of a stiff brush. So I'm dipping it in water, put some water on the brush, and I want to chip along the bottom of this windscreen rail. Try and get it so you can see what I'm doing at the same time that I can see what I'm doing. And I'm just going to wet that paint. And you can hear how stiff the brush is by the scrubby sound it's making. There we go, that's already starting to come off. Because it's grey underneath, it's a little bit difficult to see from there, I expect. Okay. Now, if you want to get really targeted, it's quite difficult to do that with a paintbrush alone. So, it's just an ordinary cocktail stick, it's quite useful really get into those edges with that and I'm going to bring that onto this sill as well because if the canopy itself is chipped it stands to reason this area here will be too
Sorry, this isn't the most exciting thing in the world to watch. Especially when you can't really see it because it's grey paint underneath. Okay. Quite happy with that. I'm just going to blow it dry. Some chipping. Don't worry about the fact that the paint looks pale around where the water's been on it. That will sort itself out. And obviously, we are going to just dress this paint finish a fair bit more before it's done. Let's move on down to this panel. concentrating this around where these latches are and the edges of the panels because I can see where the touch-ups are on the photograph behind me okay that's starting to lift does look a little bit incongruous at this point but it will it will start to make sense as time goes on just going to add a bit more hairspray here because I just use a damp cloth to wipe that and it, and it can wipe it clean off You can see this is chipping quite easily at this point and that is because the paint is so fresh. It's not had a chance to fully cure and even this soft brush is able to produce some chipping which you probably can't see on camera. When you go back in with the stiff brush it does start to damage the paint surface in effect and then the the softer brush can get in there and just start to lift. A little bit of paint away from the surface. We don't want much. It did get mucky and chipped up, but even in the photos that are from the actual Gulf War, that it's more about the dirt than the chipping. In, in, in these areas, the leading edges, certainly the paint wear was quite significant there. These, these panels in the nose were um, 
open frequently on servicing, so that's why they get chipped. There you go. See how I just used the cocktail stick a second ago just to essentially just loosen, scratch the surface of the paint basically, and once you've done that and the water can get in, it gets underneath the paint layer, and that's when it allows the hairspray underneath when it's wetted by the water essentially dissolves and it takes away the paint with it there you go that's the kind of effect we're going to get now i'll carry on and and when i come back i will show you the next stages through the paint process to get up to where the towel well, now I've got all the desert tan on and I'm going to show you the next part of uh, this finish. It's going to be very multi-layered, so patience, bear with me. Here you can see then if I bring this up to shot a bit closer, we've got a fair bit of chipping on those leading edges. It varies, it's not all the same. Some areas are chipped, some areas are not. I have used reference photos, but I've also used my mind, it's not just purely a, a completely accurate representation of the real thing. As I said before, that's a very, very difficult thing to do without either having it on hand or having a really good set of uh, photos that cover every area. So the next part then, you can see already looking down on this that although I have coverage, there is no real trace of those original camouflage colours now. So I have colour coverage, but it is quite patchy even even already I haven't got a complete smooth coat of colour and that is entirely deliberate it's slightly patchy completely on purpose so the next stage of this then I'm going to add start to add some of that deep filthiness that these things had I'll just um yeah no I'll leave the zoom as it is um, so how am I going to do that in this case there's a lot of different ways to go about doing this um, pre-shading is one post-shading is another uh, obviously normal weathering techniques with oils and washes is yet another way there are so 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 many ways to do this um, it's useful to have a number of techniques in your arsenal when it comes to, to trying to create different effects uh, if only to stop that thing where all your models look the same because you follow if you follow the same process by rote almost on every model then essentially they are going to look all the same um, so I like to try undoubtedly there's a style involved with my models and I, I think people who know me can recognize them a mile off but at the same time I do like to try and use different methods to replicate different things on different subjects now on this one I am at this stage to start adding some depth and dirt going to use um, one of these splotch masks I don't what's the correct uh, airbrush stencil yeah so this is an Ushi van der Rosten one this is etch brass as you can see uh, that he sells a couple or they he sell a couple of different sets with different different shaped holes in them you can see this one's been in use a bit uh, this is etched brass and the, the other one that I have in my possession is the is I have a set of R tool ones these come from the airbrush company um, and as you can see this is possibly even more random and what I've done with this is I've cut it away from its backing sheet because if you're not careful with these you you, you lay it on your surface and you're busily spraying away and you'll end up with a beautiful straight edge where the end of the mask is but you have to be careful of that not going to happen on this one because I've cut it out anyway I shall use these uh, sort of mottle stencils basically to add some speckly finish which is a, a way of starting to build in some of that depth into the finish that uh, the real things exhibit which is purely because of the, the way the dirt and weathering builds up over a period of time so there we go this is the one I want. I'm getting a picture up on my phone for you. Great camo, yes, but can you see there how that's sort of speckly, splotchy? This is the sort of thing that I'm looking to start to build up now. 
and even this is not going to be the final step of this by any means there will be more effects going on afterwards so what I'm going to use to spray through the mask is my my I stole this from Chris Wildchop Warchop and I think Brett Green uses the same stuff a lot as well this is um, my black brown filth slash soot mix it's always mixed up in this jar and all it is is a mixture of these two colours it's XF64 red brown and XF85 rubber black. It's roughly 50-50. The exact uh, amount doesn't really matter, but you, the end result is this dirty, dark, blackish brown mix, and it's very thin. You can't see it in there, but it's very thin. So I've got that in my in one of my airbrushes, and in the other is a thin mix, slightly thinner than normal mix. Of this desert sand so all I need to do then place the mask into position it's best to hold on to it if you can and just really lightly spray this brown mix in it is difficult because if you if you spray this heavily enough for you to really see it going on you're probably going at it a bit hard you need to build this up bit by bit whoopsie Keep turning the mask so that you don't end up with a nice kind of repetitive pattern which will look super obvious to any observer. Chuck a bit of this one into the mix, it's got much bigger apertures, it just adds different shapes and areas of, of darkness to the finish. You can see by the lack of paint going onto this white that I'm not putting a heavy coat here at all. Now, if you can even see that down there, so I'll bring it up. It's very hard for me to see this on the camera screen to be honest, but hopefully it will come through in full size. The nice sort of speckly finish there. If you do this subtly enough and well enough, you could probably get away with just leaving it like that for something as dirty as this, but I, I'm not going to. So now I've got my thinner desert sand mix back in this brush, and all I'm going to do is just lightly go back over everything. Just like that. Now hopefully the thinkers amongst you are stopping and saying, but Jen, the chipping. Well, yes, the chipping. I'm working around it basically. Um, as I said earlier, if uh, if you leave the paint too long and try and chip it, it doesn't, doesn't work so well. Um, so you have to do it bit by bit. And that obviously means that when you want to add in other effects to the paintwork that you've got to work around the chipping you've already done it, it it's a pain but it's the way it is now i'm going to use some trizac and just really lightly give that a rub over because i've sprayed the the, the sand colors whoops so lightly it does tend to leave a slightly rough finish and this is what we end up with You can still see all that speckly finish, but that's fine, that's what I want. If you put too much sand on and bury the speckles, then you've wasted your time. They need to be visible still. There are still more more steps that are going to go on this. I'm going to go back into this with some lighter mixes as well. So if the speckles or mottling that we've just applied gets too lost, then it will just get lost. So you need to make sure you can still see it to some extent. And, and this is a... To, to be fair a bit of a a bit of personal preference creeps in here as well although I am working to images of the real thing up to a point and trying to replicate 
the principle of what I see in those photos at the same time there is still going to be an element of, of the way you like to see a model finish creeping in here. I'm not personally a big fan of, of overly weathered models and when I say overly weathered I don't mean a model that's replicating a heavily weathered original I mean to me if I can look at a finished model and immediately see that it's been pre-shaded to me that means it's it's an overdone effect you should see the effect but you, sh you shouldn't be able to pick out how it's done straight away just by looking at it and the same is true of these stencil masks they are very popular at the moment it's a it's a thing that everybody's using and again if if you're if I'm too unsubtle with it so that someone can say oh there's the stencil masking then I failed I need to build up my aim is to build up the effects so that it looks the way those photographs do but in a such a way that it isn't obvious how I've done it that's just my opinion I'm not saying that's right or wrong now you see there I've tri it even before I went back over with the desert and that's because I was a bit heavy just here um, it's such a thin 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 layer that you can easily rub it back off again if you think you've gone over the top let's go back in then with this sand notice also that I'm spraying this in quite a sort of a random way and I'm not over spraying it in a way that that promotes full and even coverage and again that's deliberate so some of this some of this dark mottling will show through in some areas a little bit more than it does in others completely deliberate because what I'm aiming for ultimately is an extremely patchy dirty finish it's very difficult for the human brain to be truly random so this is where these masks are helpful likewise when you uh, pop back in with your trizac afterwards that will obviously remove again some of that sand that just went on which will vary the finish even more hopefully I'm starting to see the sort of thing I'm trying to achieve here you can see it's a bit lighter than the other side which is fine this is a slightly dark sort of base finish here so I was always going to lighten it up a bit but it's lighter and yet patchier so that's exactly the effect I'm trying to achieve uh, and I'll be back to you with the light shading in, in a while And there we go then, I did not film the light shading in the end because it's exactly the same process just with a, a, a lightened tint of the original colour rather than a completely different colour. So that was done with the model masks again and then over painted again with a very very thin mixture of the original colour and then the whole thing has been rubbed back down again with Trizac. Um, so it is quite subtle I suppose I can see it with my eyes I don't know if it's coming through on the camera but we've got a quite a sort of variegated look to the finish there's some areas where it's quite worn there's other areas where it isn't underneath no light shading this is just the sort of dirt model effects have gone on the bottom here obviously the bellies don't fade so much especially when you're flying around 100 feet above the desert and the next the next phase for this um, will be uh, the, the airframe itself, the flaps and the slats, the tail planes and undercarriage doors I'm not going to gloss, there's no decals going on them, there's no need to mess with them. The, the airframe itself uh, and the slats and flaps I will now be glossing with X22 but it'll be a very 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 thin down mixture of X22 because what I want it to do is, is almost sort of seep down through this finish and really just glue everything together as it were. Um, there isn't, as I explained earlier, there isn't a lot of excess hairspray in places I didn't want it but at the same time there is still some there and I need to seal this finish because for decals to come and indeed for 
um, washes and filters I, I don't need that to be soaking through into this and getting getting into any of that hairspray so x22 next um, I'm going to call that it for this video that's the sort of main basics of getting this color on um, I have a lot of small sort of detail areas to paint now um, get that gloss on and I think for the next video we'll come back and look at these crazy Edward peelable decals and see if we can make them work on this model I really hope I can <laughs> or else I'm, I'm going to be quite cross uh, anyway so let's leave it there then until next time which will be uh, Desert Babes number seven uh, I'll see you then so until then look after yourselves look after each other and Genesis out